Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for staying until the end. Uh, there's like great music, but I'm promised they're not going to start serving any drinks or having any music until we're completely done with every demo we're going to do today. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Greg Braille. I'm part of the Apogee team at Google, where I do an architecture kind of thing. Um, I've been working on APIs and API management for a really long time. And um, in this presentation, we're going to talk about what APIs are briefly. Um, what they mean, we're going to see some demos, and we're going to hear a lot of information and, and a good session from British Telecom on how they are actually able to successfully do things with their own API program. So I'll be handing things over as we go along to David and to Kevin for more of this. Um, one thing I'm going to mention is that when the session is over, and apparently you can't do it till the session is over, um, until 20 minutes is up, uh, there is on the, on the next feedback app, we always appreciate a, uh, if you fill out the survey. That's just something that uh, is a helpful thing to do. Any comments would be appreciated there. We'll also stick around afterwards when we get to the end of the time if you want to have any conversation with us about what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to speak about APIs, and I'm going to speak about how they can be used to empower a digital transformation and to enable innovation. We'll be hearing from British Telecom about their API journey. And then we're going to see some examples of APIs in action. We're going to see some demos of APIs from the outside in, first from the perspective of a consumer of APIs, then from the perspective of an API product manager. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about API management, what it is and what it does. So we have a lot to talk about. I always like to start by talking sort of about what's happening in the day of the life of APIs. APIs are something that are not new. APIs, the term is you know, 40 years old. Uh, usually when we say APIs now, we're talking about web APIs, APIs that are accessible on the internet or inside a company's network and that people use to build all sorts of new things. So we have some great examples in here of some of the things that customers and people who are not customers, by the way, have done with APIs. So for instance, Magalu, uh, formerly known as Magazine Luiza, is a retailer in Brazil. They're actually Brazil's largest retailer. Uh, they have been, for a long time, a series of brick and mortar shops. And what they've been able to do in the last couple of years is create a, turn themselves into a platform that producers of merchandise and purchasers of merchandise and all kinds of third parties can use to take advantage of their retail platform to bring themselves to the, uh, to the Brazilian market. This is very much like what Amazon did in the United States, where nowadays when you buy something from Amazon, it rarely actually comes from Amazon, yet they're making a lot of money. Magalu has had some incredible financial results here, and in a way, they're kind of the Amazon of Brazil, which is kind of funny because they already have one there. Anyway, um, other examples here, for instance, Arity we're mentioning as one example of the many companies that have used APIs to make it easier to onboard developers, but more importantly, to bring partners on board, to make it easy for a company through APIs who does business with partners rather than having the types of integration that we used to have where we have to have phone calls and exchange credentials and things, making it possible for a developer to learn what a company has to offer and sign up and start using it via self-service. And that's a theme that we're going to see a lot during this presentation. So one of the things that have happened as APIs have gone along, again, APIs are not new. We started talking about APIs, not just Apogee, but a lot of different people, you know, almost 10 years ago. And what we saw was that my graphics are gone. That's interesting. Um, oh, well. What we saw was that um, people started with point-to-point -point integrations. They started with, hey, I need something to stick in front of my mainframe so I can build a mobile app. And that ended up with people deploying API gateways and other pieces of technology that were literally a proxy from one thing to another and solved a very specific technical problem. But then what came beyond that are things like omnichannel retail and other things where companies are creating differentiating digital experiences, starting with mobile apps. But now we have voice assistants and connected cars and all kinds of things. I don't know if connected refrigerators will ever really be a thing, but connected everything else probably will be. All of that stuff is powered by APIs. But the really powerful businesses and the ones to think about are the ones like Magalu and even to a certain extent like Amazon, who have been able to use APIs to create new platforms and new ecosystems to drive completely new lines of business by opening what they do as, instead of just a, a proprietary website or a proprietary thing, a set of open APIs that enable 
all kinds of third parties, customers, and partners to use the capabilities of these existing companies in new and innovative ways and drive new revenue streams. And we're going to start by talking a little bit about someone who's actually gone on an API journey within their corporation. And they're going to talk in some detail about the API program that they have and how they run it. So we're going to move on to David from our British Telecom. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Elston. I'm the lead strategist in BT's Partner Marketplace team. I'd like to spend a bit of time talking to you today about our API journey and how our partnership with Apogee has really helped power our organization. We'll start by stepping through our business context, what that meant for our API strategy, key learnings from the program, and where we're heading next. Sound good? Cool. I will acknowledge at this stage I'm probably the tallest person everybody's seen today, so let's get that out of the way very quickly. Um, let's go back to last month. BT Brands was relaunched. Partnerships remained a cornerstone of our business strategy. Across the BT organization, continue to market three customer-facing brands, BT, EE, and PlusNet. And I actually want to use EE as an example, if that's OK with everybody, um, which itself has been on somewhat of a journey over recent years. So back in 2010, we brought together the, the Orange and the T-Mobile networks to create everything everywhere. So quite a complex organization across the board. Back then, we had two mobile networks, two business organizations, two sets of back-end architecture. It's really quite a complex organization. We needed to make E easier to deal with, but we didn't want to just go out and buy another tech firm. That would have actually created more complexity, not less complexity, with further integration layers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We needed to be agile. So our products and technology teams went out into market. We selected Apogee. We wrapped our legacy architecture into a cloud-based API layer and delivered an optimized solution. A BT, we're a complex organization, got multiple customer brands. We don't have the ambition just to build everything ourselves. It's expensive enough, right? Three customer, three customer brands to manage. Things get expensive. That's not where we're at. And looking forwards, the relationship with Apogee is important now, as it was back then with EE, as increasing complexity of, across BT, across both our fixed and mobile networks. So how do we manage our program? It's actually quite straightforward. We start by taking what we know about our customers, 20 million of them, across a range of different touch points. And we use what we know to develop truly personalized experiences. And this then informs our own product build strategy through an API-first approach, through our core and digital estates. And over the years, that's enabled us to establish a comprehensive catalog internally of over 10,000 APIs, which we're now, having gone on that journey from, right, from left to right, we're now migrating from right to left, working with our external partners to actually monetize this activity that we've generated and built internally to help our partners inform their own product build strategies, which in turn enables them to personalize their experiences for their customers. And that's what's really driving the monetization activity of our program. So what have we learned from this activity so far? It's not straightforward. There's four key takeouts, which would be really good to unpack with you right now. The first is structure. And there's four different elements of this. The first one is, look, it's, it's really complex. It's not straightforward to balance the commercial monetization activity of the program with the partner or customer experience. So for that reason, it's absolutely fundamental that this program really sits within the core business as opposed to the technology functions. So those trade-offs can be made most appropriately. Second within structure, agility. And by this, we mean really building an agile team of dedicated resources that you've got in-house. You're not relying on the usual bottlenecks that often happen in big businesses. So within BT, what that means for us is we've got dedicated resource in a central team that covers strategy, project management, sales, business development, partner integration. All as absolutely dedicated resources that you're not having to you know, beg, borrow, and steal internally, the usual politics of resources. We're not managing any of that. We're completely self-sufficient. The third element within structure is really about the individuals that you're recruiting into those roles. And it's really important to strike the right balance between external industry experts who can really drive your business development activity out in market, 
and also internal expertise. So for us, experienced BTers who can drive the mobilization and the engagement internally, really get things moving through the organization. And the final element on structure is really about the, the sort of the secondary layer inside the, inside the structure. So really a hub and spoke model, working with dedicated business partner resource in other areas of the business, let's say finance, technology, on a more ad hoc basis. So if you need technological impact assessments or financial business case verification, that sort of thing is done with agreed SLAs to really maintain that momentum that you've generated through this agile approach. So that's structure, number one. Number two is oxygen. And by this, we mean not really getting suffocated by the core business, the same usual trade-offs with more established product areas. Whilst this activity is growing and, and at the outset, it's really important that it gets given the space to grow. It needs funding. Funding is absolutely fundamental. We need to build an absolutely scalable platform. But the focus is really avoiding or resisting the temptation to focus on short-term, quick wins that can sort of evidence to the more insecure elements of the organization, look, this progress is generating a, a return. You need to have the confidence to invest in the long term, protect the funding, but really resist the temptation just solving for short-term objectives. And the final element within this as well is in, in year one and year two, when you're starting to see that growth emerge, again, resist the temptation to sort of class it as BAU activity, fold it back into the core business, because again, you'll, you'll end up crashing into the same bottlenecks, trying to justify resources, justify investment against much more established parts of the organization. And that's, again, where the whole process becomes somewhat paralyzed. So that's oxygen. Iterating at scale, number three. This is really about building repeatable solutions. And in our experience at BT, it's really about starting with established product areas as opposed to starting from a complete standing start in new areas of the business. For us, what that meant was starting with our direct carrier billing platform and improving that technology, improving that growth through better functioning technology and more, and more efficient information. And what we've done with that, and in turn, that's opened up new doors to new opportunities through a commoditized solution, commoditized approach. But the key is absolutely building a scalable solution that can grow and flex as the activity grows. The fourth and last area in terms of the key learnings is really about communication. So by virtue of being a ring-fenced part of the organization, it's absolutely fundamental to take the, take the wider business on the journey with you. So for us at BT, what that's meant is two things. The first is exec-level engagement, regular, regular updates to the board, really bringing to life the benefits of two things, the ring-fenced approach that we've taken and the ring-fenced investment that the team has. And what we've done with that is really driven engagement right at the top of our sea level. And the second part of communication is really about Bringing, bringing the peer group on board with you as well. So within BT, we sit with a marketing organization. And what that means is engagement with our CMO to do two things. The first is making sure that he's absolutely aware of the return on investment that has been driven by the funding that the team has got and is protected. And what that means is, and I'm sure every organization feels this as well, when you get the usual budgetary challenges every six or 12 months, the CMO has got the right level of context, the appropriate level of information, to make those decisions to protect the investment when he's being challenged elsewhere. And the second part of that is to really broadcast the savings that are being generated internally as well. So this isn't just about incremental revenue generation in an external market. The API program is obviously generating a more efficient way of working. And it's really important to broadcast the savings that you've been generated as well through the more efficient model through the API first approach to build. So those are the key learnings. So where are we heading next? I think it's really important to note that we're now recognized within BT as a strategic growth initiative. And by that, we mean we're growing our direct margin performance 30 to 40% year on year, and that's actually showing signs of acceleration. And it's important to note at this stage that that was actually in excess of our original tranche of, tr of, of budget to secure the transformational investment that we've got. And again, the temptation is here to get a bit too excited, get a bit carried away with where that growth is going, and overcommit, overpromise into as yet undefined opportunities. So at BT, what we've really done with that is been super targeted in a number of very, very precise new markets that we've got to go after. We're not committing in the budget to as yet undefined opportunities or pipe dreams that you might, you might want to call. The second focus that we've got is, is being super targeted in new markets. The second focus is really about expanding this cap core capability. So we've started with EE. We're now expanding it into the wider BT organization as well. That's really, really important. 
The second point is we've now recognized as a, as a CEO-sponsored initiative as well. And by this, we mean we've got three key benefits from being recognized by the CEO. He's absolutely bought into the subject. He completely gets it. What that enables us to do is three things. Secure and accelerate headcount resource. So as the team builds, as the resource scales, as the business grows, we've got a real streamlined approach to get the right people in the team in a much more quick fashion than you would have done normally. The second is protecting that resources. So again, in BT, we've got a ring fence group of, of, of investment that we have. Now, as I'm sure most businesses do, you get the regular challenges, the regular six to 12 month budgetary challenges. We have the confidence of BT that that is, that is protected. The CEO gets it, he's bought into it, so therefore we have a confidence that our, our transformational program continue regardless. And the third area is, is obstacle resolution. So again, big businesses like BT, there's often, there's often bottlenecks that exist. We really do see an acceleration when these regular exco sessions happen, anything that needs to be resolved straight up the line and it's been resolved really quickly. And that's really helped us maintain the momentum that was generated through this agile protected program. And we're also starting to open up new markets. So we're talking about our external monetization program at the minute. It's really important to BT to, to look at opportunities where we can improve customer experience, improve our partner propositions, and drive incremental revenue to the BT organization. A good example of this is the work that we're currently doing in the UK financial services sector, working with a number of banks, looking at payment authentication and anti-fraud solution. So that's a good example of something that ticks those three boxes of improved customer experience, improving the bank's propositions, and generating incremental revenue for the BT organization. And finally, we're running center of excellence workshops with a number of operators globally. We're really bringing to life the benefits of housing all of this organizational content in a single defined area of the business, single protected area of the business, and really bringing to life the benefits of having it housed centrally as opposed to siloed areas of the organization. So we've run a number of those, and they've gone down really well with the areas that we've engaged with so far. So just to recap, this is, this is a really complex organization. It's a really complex market. The work that we've done with Apogee has really helped us unlock the, an efficient route to growth that we're now starting to accelerate and grow through an agile, targeted, ring-fenced approach. And I think communication across your organization is absolutely key to unlock the further benefits that can be driven by this program. So I'll hand back to Greg who can talk about the API demo. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've heard from some of the things that BT has been able to do to use APIs to drive innovation within their company. Now we're going to kind of change gears a bit and talk about um, caravans. Actually, we're going to talk about RVs. Um, but I'm from America, so I understand that these are actually caravans. Um, and the reason we're going to do that is because we're going to kind of change things a bit. Often, if you've ever seen an Apogee presentation or an API management presentation, the most important thing is that you create a proxy. It's like, no, that's the fifth most important thing. The most important thing is that you create an API. So Kevin is going to show us what it looks like to be a consumer of an API, and then he's going to talk about API product management and why that's important, and there will be caravans. So thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I'm from uh, the Netherlands. And as you might be aware, we are quite infamous about our, uh, our driving, uh, especially with caravans during uh, holiday breaks. Um, so I've created a demo out of that. And I will show you first from an API consumer perspective, then from an API product manager perspective, and later on as well from an operations perspective, how this specific use case is applied to APIs. So with that, uh, let's get started. If I can switch to my laptop, then we'll see the, there it is, the caravan tracker. This is just to help the Dutch um, to check if whenever they go on a trip, if it's still safe to, uh, to tow their caravan with a specific car. So it's a simple demo, but what I've done, I've loaded it with all the Dutch license plates. So whenever you enter those license plates and a weight of your caravan, um, this will tell you if it's safe to go on your trip. So let's, uh, let's give it a spin. So a license plate, and let's assume I have 2,000 kilos of my trailer, my RV, or my, uh, my caravan. Let's, um, let's check it. Um, so we get some feedback. There's obviously an API call behind this, right? So we have checked this license plate. We know this is uh, what kind of car it is, and we also know the maximum amount that it can tow, which is... Uh, Thousand kilos, so that's a bit less for my um, for my example. So let's try another license plate. 
And yeah, this one is fine. A, bi a bit of a heavier car, and it can tow 2,100 kilos. That's, uh, that's suitable for my trip, right? So I can, I can go on vacation with this. Um, the idea behind this is that it's, um, it's a super simple application that I've built, uh, and I'm using an API to do this. And as an API consumer, I'm worried about the user experience. That's what I want to focus on. And I don't want to really spend my energy on understanding the API or uh, how the backend really works, right? So in order to make that possible, there's a developer portal. A developer portal is a website for developers, API consumers, where they can go. And they can discover APIs. They can quickly see how an API works. And they can quickly get access to those APIs. They can onboard themselves to it. And that's actually, as an API consumer, what I've done to build my application. So I just want to, to demo you this developer portal and show you the advantage of it. So as a, as a developer, I, I can come to this developer portal and quickly click on Get Started, which will, uh, will give me the steps that are needed to get myself onboarded. So just three steps. I have to sign in. I have to register my app, and then I get my keys. And that's all I need to get started. So this is helping me, and it's also providing, it's even providing me some JavaScript example code um, to actually um, get an example on how to consume this. So that's, that's good. I now know a little bit more on how to get myself onboarded. So let's look at the APIs. There's two APIs, the, specifically for this use case. Um, we call these APIs products. Uh, because actually, there's more to it than just an API. We have packaged them. We have bundled them. We have added a quota to it. So the trial product is giving me 100 calls per day. And the premium is giving me a little bit more. I probably have to pay for it, or I have to be a, have to be a special consumer to actually get access to the premium, because it's giving me 10,000 calls per day. So as an API consumer, I can make my choice which product I'm interested in and um, then dive into it. Right. So this is a very simple API. It, it just has one path. It's taking two parameters, so the plate and the weight. We've already seen it on the, on the app. But then this, this, uh, this developer portal and this documentation is giving me clear, uh, a clear overview on how the response looks like, what kind of uh, response codes I can see, like a 200 or 201 when there's no license plate found, uh, 400 when there's bad input. So for me, as a developer, super easy to quickly understand this API to get going, right? And then another thing I can do, I can try out the API directly from this documentation. So on the right, uh, there's um, a form I can fill in and to test this API. I can fill in the plate. I can fill in the weight and uh, 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 see how the API behaves and how the API works, right? But if, before I do that, I need to authorize. Because this API is not wide open, it is protected by Apigee with an API key. This, th those are the API credentials that Apigee is enforcing. So in order for me to do that, I need to uh, add an authorization key. And I will, I will do it later. I will first show, sh sh show you how to get one. So I'm already logged in as a developer. Um, and I can navigate to my applications. And you see I already have quite a few applications registered. Whenever I'm interested in, in registering a new one, I just give it a name. So uh, this is the next app. And I'm selecting the trial um, API product to consume. And I'm creating my app. So what this will do in Apigee, let's see, create. Could not be created. It's the demo. We'll just uh, stick with the ones that I already have. Let's assume I just created this app. Um, so uh, the premium app, and what it's showing me actually is a key and a secret, which are these API credentials that I have to use to uh, use to scroll the API. I could copy it and then um, uh, use this key when calling the API. But in our, in our documentation, you don't need to copy it because we, um, we give you the opportunity to actually select your app when I'm authorizing here in the documentation. So because I'm logged in, all my apps are known here and the keys actually that I'm using for it as well. So I can select one. Let's, let's take the car loan app. I authorize and now my keys are set for any consumption that I'm doing. So whenever I'm calling this API, let's uh, call another license plate, uh, 2000. I'm calling the API and I see what's coming back. In this case, the license plate belongs to uh, Model S, Tesla. And the fun thing is that a Tesla uh, can, cannot tow anything. Electric cars are not made for that. Um, uh, so that's, um, that's a way on how, as a developer, I can, I can really quickly see how the, how the, how the yeah, response data looks like. Even I can play around with it a bit. If I execute it too quickly, we run into spike arrest. We're actually protecting it with this API against too much traffic. 
Also, if I enter a license plate that doesn't exist, uh, the API is telling me this in a certain way. So as a developer, I'm fully understanding how this API works, what kind of different responses it can give. And um, with this, I'm good to go to actually uh, build my app, as you have seen. So with that, I think we have seen how an API consumer works with, with Apigee. So can we move back to the slides, please? And Yes. So the, 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 the thing that was works on a developer portal is that we're not exposing APIs individually. We have packaged them into what we call products. And uh, API, API as products is, um, is a really important mindset if you handle with APIs. It means you're treating APIs as something that your organization is putting into the market. Not necessarily selling for a price, but you're offering these APIs as products. APIs are certainly not projects, because a project actually focuses on completion within time and cost. But the product is actually focused on consumption, which means you have to uh, use these APIs and bring them to market to actually drive people to use them. That means, and it's really important, you have to focus on the end user. You have to focus on the customer for whom you're actually solving a problem. And an API is therefore not a technical thing. No, it's something that's owned by the business that is a product that is solving problems for your customers. And I want to make a um, uh, small example with that. You probably all know Lego, right? And a Lego brick, it's, um, it's a super simple uh, thing, right, that, that is easy to use. It's, it's easy to understand how a Lego brick connects to other Lego bricks and how you can build something out of it, right? And a Lego brick comes in a few sizes and a few colors. Um, but in essence, it's a technical thing. And Lego, as a company, they're not selling Lego bricks individually. Right? What they've done, they've packaged these Lego bricks into boxes with a, with a label, with a nice experience in, on, on, uh, on the box on what you could build with it. And actually, there's documentation in it. And it's, they are super easy to use. And the same holds with APIs. So APIs shouldn't be actually marketed or pr provided individually. They should actually follow the same patterns as Lego is doing. They should be labeled, easy documentation, and easy to use. And they should be owned by the business, right? And being owned by the business means there's also um, an API product manager or a product owner who is actually driving the product life cycle, striving for consumption of his product. And that actually brings me into my next demo. And we're now stepping in a new role. Uh, before, we were actually an ap application developer consuming APIs. Now we are a product manager. And our, uh, our mission in life is actually to drive consumption of our API products and to manage the li API product life cycle. Yeah, thank you. So here I'm logged into Apigee, um, and I'm an API product manager. So what I'm really in interested in is to see what kind of API products do we have. And I hope it's not too small. I can zoom in a bit. Um, really the same two products that we had on our developer portal, right? But now I can, as an API product manager, I can really look into these products. Um, I can see the quotas we have set for it. Uh, we, can we can change them. As we see, we can make other products uh, out of this. And also, we can um, uh, configure what kind of APIs are actually bundled into this product. So whenever somebody gets access to this product, this is what they can do with it. This is all the APIs they can access. And then at the bottom, I can also see what kind of consumption we have on this product. I can see the apps that have registered. I see the developers that have, have shown interest. They've registered themselves to use this API. But that's just configuration. That's just registration. Really, what I'm interested in as well is um, uh, how are we doing with this API? How's, how's the consumption going? So with our analytics, I'll wait for it to load, we can, we can show you the, um, let's go last hour. We can show you what kind of API calls we've been receiving. Um, uh, also, we can show you uh, what kind of APIs people have been calling, if it, they were successful or they were running into errors. Also, the kind of latency that we see on those APIs. Are, are our APIs responding with an SLAs? Are they quick enough for our developers to be happy with them, right? Another thing I'm interested in is, um, as an API product manager is to see the developers that, have actually, that are actually driving traffic. So again, I will go to the last hour. Wait for it to load. It's, um, it's then showing in the last hour, these developers have actually been consuming our API products. So we see a few apps. Um, uh, of course, this, this only API, Caravan Tracker, that I have, the developers, and the API products they are driving. And this gives me huge insights. Who are my important consumers of my APIs? And who is not really consuming anything yet? So I might be able to help them 
or maybe I need to change my API a bit for them to, to make it more useful for these, for these developers. Then another thing um, I'm interested in is where actually is this API being used? Is it being used by our developers in, um, in web applications or in mobile applications? And then what kind of operating systems are people consuming this on? So this is just um, um, a, a subset of the information we are seeing. But for an API product manager, this is, this is hugely valuable information to actually get an understanding of the consumption of their APIs. And this can all really be used into the API product lifecycle to, to steer it in the right direction. And then there's one last thing I would like to show you. <coughs> it's, a, uh, it's a custom report, uh, because actually we're processing information about cars. So as an API product manager, it's super easy. I'll just select two days. It's super easy to uh, run a report to show what kind of cars are people actually wanting to use behind, by, behind their cars. And it's, um, it's all Alfa Romeo. Um, actually, if, it, if it will take a longer time, we'll see what people are using, uh, what kind of cars are people asking or requesting through our, through our APIs. So actually, with that, we have seen how, as a product manager, I can keep an, an eye on uh, the API product lifecycle. I can really see the consumption and use that um, in the, yeah, to manage the lifecycle of my APIs and to drive towards consumption. So with that, I think we can go back to slides. So thanks. I, we're going to bring back Kevin a little later and, and hopefully do another demo. I think we have some time. But basically, what we just showed you, we always talk about this at Apogee. It's actually required in my contract, only kidding. But that we t there's this thing, this concept Apogee came up with called the Apogee value chain. And the point of this is to show that in order for an API to be successful, you have to get value all the way from that back end system that does the heavy lifting all the way to the customer. What Kevin just did was he showed us what it looks like to be in two roles. To be in the role of the API consumer, the person who's actually building the API, who's actually building the app. I'm sorry, not the one building the API. And the role of the API producer. And in the world of APIs and API management, the role of API producing is not just application developers who write code and stick HTTP endpoints on the internet. It's also about how we're going to define policies around how that API is exposed and how we control and monitor who is using that API, how they're consuming it, and how much they're consuming it. And that's exactly what we were just looking at. So this whole world is the discipline of API lifecycle management or full lifecycle API management. This is a whole product category, of which Apogee is, of course, the product that I'm going to speak about, which is all about putting some frameworks and some tools around the whole process of creating an API, building it, deploying it, making some decisions about how it can be consumed and how much it's going to be consumed, publishing it to developers, and those developers might be within a large or a medium-sized organization in a multinational company. They might be in a different part of the group. Or they might be developers who are partners or customers or people who are completely unknown to you, which is the kind of API Kevin was building. Um, all of these people fill into this whole life cycle, and it's a cycle. You know, as, you're, as the API product manager is examining the performance of the API and measuring it against their metrics, they're making decisions about what kind of API do we need to build next? What changes do we need to make to get more engagement? Are we getting business value out of this API? With the right metrics and the right data about the API program, an API product manager might even discover that there are services inside the corporation that are no longer being used. Um, and, and we've seen this when people start to bring API management to bear on internal problems, where all of a sudden you now have visibilities not only about what APIs are being used, but what applications are using them. And now you, can, um, you may be able to have some services you don't even need anymore, and you can turn off. It's very hard to deprecate something if you don't know who's using it. And the really important thing about this is that API management is really the only kind of product that is responsible for this relationship. Network load balancers are important to make the network work. Web application firewalls, identity systems, application servers, containerization technology, that's all part of the infrastructure. 
Once you want to take that service you have built on that infrastructure and make it available to developers via self-service and have some hope of understanding who's using it and how much and having some control over that, you need to have API management. So Apigee is our API management product, and it brings in all these kinds of things we just talked about. Up on the top, it brings in tools and technologies for the developer, like a catalog of APIs, like API portals. There are even functions for things like monetization, where if an op a product manager wishes to charge for an API, which is actually not something that works for everybody, but it works for some people, you have an option to do that. Right? If Kevin wanted to charge five, five cents per caravan, he could. I'm not sure who would pay that, but maybe Dutch people really love their caravans. I don't know. Car dealers might do that, actually. You can sell that to car dealers. Um, another would be monitoring and analytics, and that's really a second part of this whole API management world, which is how do I use that metadata about my API traffic to make decisions about my business? And are, there are two interesting, really, parts of that. One is one we saw, which was the custom report. This API request actually has information in it about, for instance, the type of car that's being used. So yeah, there may be some really smart developer on the back end who, when they built the legacy system that gives you the answer to this, keeps track of what cars are actually being queried. But if there isn't, you have that information in the API request. And if we're sitting in between the client and the server, we can actually extract that information and use it to present you with stuff. There's also a very interesting part of this capability called advanced API ops. This is a new feature that's part of Apigee that gives you more sophisticated API monitoring, and it includes things like anomaly detection. So for instance, it will tell you if you know, normally this application drives a certain amount of traffic. Today, we noticed a 10 times increase in the amount of traffic, or a 10 times increase in the error rate. These are all things you might want to take action on immediately because you've now been alerted. You might even have an issue where you've seen a, a, a huge decrease in the amount of API traffic or even in the, in the uh, traffic for a particular application. This might cause you to check to see if something is going on in the infrastructure, or if it's one of your top API consumers that stops consuming your API, you might want to get in contact with them and find out why they're not using your API anymore. Has something gone wrong on their end, or have they changed their business strategy? And then on the bottom is all the technical stuff that makes the API go, the actual proxy that sits in between the client and server and enforces the policies. And just some of the things that customers really need in order to, to make an API program works, like mediation and transformation. And this is really important, because what's on the bottom is basically what's called an API gateway. And everyone talks about API gateways. And API gateways are a very important part of the API management world. But they're only a part. The part that the API gateway plays is in enforcing the policies. <coughs> but API gateways are also used in all kinds of applications because they can help you make an API facade. They can help you take a series of microservices or services that aren't even so micro and put a facade into them to make them a consistent API. So for instance, customers who are developing with microservices might have 100 microservices or 1,000 microservices. You'd be crazy to share all those 1,000 microservices with everybody. But if you can put a wrapper around them and make that a consistent API, now it's much easier for people to consume your consistent contract while under the covers, you're free to change how your microservices are built. People also do this with legacy systems. Put a facade in front of a legacy system, build new applications on top of that easy to use, easy consume API facade, and over time, maybe that legacy system gets decomposed or replaced or someday even shut off. But without that consistent API contract, you can't even begin to do that. One last thing I'll mention about hybrid before we go back to Kevin. Um, one last thing I'll mention about Apigee before we go back to Kevin is that Apigee actually runs in a couple of configurations. We've always run a software as a service on Google Cloud, which means all, the, all the, the things that Apigee does are available completely as a service. We run the infrastructure. We scale it up and down, whatever. Customers have told us very clearly that often, especially when they use APIs internally, that both the, produce, both the target system that the API is calling and the client that's calling the API are within their own data center or within their own cloud region. They might even be in another cloud. I hear there are other clouds out there other than Google Cloud. And in many of those cases, our customers have told us, we like Apigee. We don't want to run all of Apigee in our data center. But we need that API gateway. We need that proxy to be in our data center, because we don't want the traffic. We don't want the, the critical data to leave 
our data center for availability reasons or privacy reasons. So what Apogee Hybrid does is it takes the API gateway, the runtime part of that diagram from two slides ago, and puts it wherever you need it to be on a Kubernetes cluster running on Anthos. So anywhere that Anthos goes, your API runtime can go. Um, and then the rest of Apogee, the analytics, the user interface, the management APIs, run as a managed service in the Google Cloud. This is a very effective way to use Apogee if you have to have a lot of control over where the API gateway runs um, compared to the, soft the software as a service model, which lets, you, which lets us run everything for you. So this gives you another deployment option for Apogee and makes it a lot easier to bring full lifecycle API management to everything you do. So with that done, we have a few more minutes. Kevin is going to do one more demo, and we're going to get a little bit into the weeds about how Apogee works and show you what some of the pieces of the demo are, and then we'll be done. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, so the demo I built actually looks like this. Oh, sorry, can you go back to the slides? Yeah, it looks like this. Um, so I've loaded the data set of all the Dutch license plates, all the cars that are registered in the Netherlands, into Cloud SQL. Um, and I've added a Cloud Function on top of that to actually expose a backend API from it. But this backend API is just quite dumb. It just exposes information about cars. There's no uh, traffic management, no quotas, no security, um, no consumption, no caching. It's, 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 a, it's a backend API, right? So I needed Apigee as an API proxy to proxy API traffic through this Cloud Function to actually add all of that logic in order for me to actually treat this as an API product to add quotas to it, to add security to it, like the API keys, the credentials that I was, uh, was showing you on the developer portal. So other things I'm doing is I'm formatting the request. Because the backend does know, doesn't know anything about caravans, I'm adding, adding that logic inside Apache, and I'm doing the test uh, towards the weight of the caravan that's asked for and the actual supported weight by the car, and actually add that in a more nicer JSON response out of Apache. So uh, quite a lot of logic inside Apache. So as an API operations manager, I would need to keep an eye on this, right? I would want to know if my APIs are up, if Fulium is still within normal, uh, not too much, not, 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 not a big drop in API volume. And I would like to see the latency. I would want to monitor the latency of my API proxy as they're being consumed to the outside world. And also would want to like to monitor the latency of my cloud function, right? Is my backend still up? Is Google Cloud still doing, is still Google Cloud still performing? I'm sure it does, but I still want to monitor it. So uh, can we go back to the laptop, please, please? Yeah, thanks. So now we're still in Apogee. Um, same user interface, but now, again, a different role. I'm now an, uh, an operations manager. And as an operations manager, I'm more interested in the, in the technical monitoring. Oops, sorry. So I'm, I'm opening the, um, the API monitoring screen. And right here, I, I get from the last hour information around the total traffic, the error rate, and the latency. I think the latency looks good, half a second. The error rate looks a bit high, right, 30, 34%. So it's, it's something I might be interested in to, um, to, to look at as an operations manager. Are, the, are these errors coming from a specific consumer? Are these errors coming from the back end? Um, or is, is somebody maybe uh, deliberately pushing errors into our, into our platform? So then if I, if I click on the timeline, I can see all this information over time. So I can see, is this now happening for a longer period? Has this happened all of a sudden? Uh, when did it start happening? And when I know when it started happening, I can dive into it and see what kind of API consumer was starting to push traffic to my APIs from that moment in time. So we see this from total traffic. And uh, we can see that for latency and, uh, and errors as well. So another thing that is quite interesting to, to get an overview for the API operations manager is the investigation screen. Um, right now, we're, we're showing errors. Um, and we have a kind of heat map with color coding when errors were actually happening. So um, I, can, I can go into a specific period of time and get a summary on this six-minute window where actually um, uh, I had more error calls than usual, right? So I can zoom into this. I can then even view into the logs to see the individual API calls. Um, Apigee is not storing the complete API call. It's not storing payload or anything, but we have to make the metadata. So we can give you information on what kind of calls were happening at this point in time uh, for you to actually find out why there were more errors than usual. 
Um, so another thing I'm interested in as an API operations manager is security. And there's basically two things I, I, I'm, um, I want to keep an eye on. One, are my APIs being executed over HTTPS, so TLS, are they encrypted? And are the API developers, so the, the ones building the API proxies in Apache, are they applying the right policies? Are they applying the right security to my APIs? So both of the thi these things I want to keep an eye on, right? And we can do that in our security reporting. So the first thing, at runtime, I can check my APIs. How are they being consumed? Are they being consumed over the right um, uh, protocol, right? So um, in this case, my percentage non-HTTPS traffic is zero, which ma is making me happy. So it looks like everybody is consuming it over a secure channel. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's perfect. I also see the change in the API calls, 600% um, more API calls than usual. And that's quite logical, because I'm running a script in the background driving API traffic at, as of this moment. Then over to the other thing is configuration. Right here, I will see a list of all my APIs. And for each API, I can view what kind of policies have been applied by the, the, by the API developers. So uh, I can check the kind of traffic management policies, checking quota, spike rest, caching. I can check the security policies that have been applied, so checking an API key, but also OAuth, YAUT tokens. Um, maybe we have some SAML. Um, all these kind of security policies can be applied to APIs. And then there's extension policies. They could be used to do some checks or do some transformations. So if, I, if we select the Caravan Tracker API, I, we can quickly view what kind of policies have been applied. And these are typically the things that I've already showed you. So there's a quota being enforced. There's caching enforced. And also there's a spike rest. From the security, we are checking API keys. And we have seen that because as an API developer, I first had to get a key before I was able to call the API. Um, yeah, so I think I'll leave it with that. Um, so as a... Um, as an API operations manager, I can, can get a lot of insights. And I know the health of my APIs. That's basically the whole thing. And when things are out of the ordinary, I can quickly zoom into this and get some more information. But really, I also want to be notified proactively when something goes wrong. So we can create alerts uh, on all these kind of metrics that I showed you before. We can set alerts. In this case, I have an alert when there's too many errors. I think I've set it when there's more than 50% errors in, within 10 minutes. And in that case, I want to get an email. I want to be called out of bed in the middle of the night to look at the API to make sure that people can check their caravans. Right? So that's it, Greg. Back to you. Thank you. So we've come to the end, and we're pretty much out of time. So thanks for coming. Um, and what we're going to do is, since we're pretty much out of time, we'll be around. We can talk more individually if people have questions. One thing I will also say is people often take pictures of these and stuff. I don't think they're going to post this video, but we did a very similar session at Next in San Francisco in April. So if you Google search the name of this session, you should come up with a YouTube video, which is sort of the recorded version of the live performance that we just gave you. Um, so, um, but it doesn't have caravans. It has something else. It has weather, I think, because the person who did the demo liked weather and didn't have a caravan. I actually have a caravan, but that's a story for another time. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Thanks for staying till the end, and enjoy the rest of your day.